Midsummer Night's Dream. I mean, oh. is there a better play? Yes, there is. There's Hamlet. But um, <laughs> is there a better play for everyone? I mean, I don't think there is. I mean, as much as I, I, I like to be, you know, of course there is. Um, there's, there's Hamlet. Um, and Richard II. And, and Henry IV. Um, and Winter's Tale. But uh, I love Labor's Lost, which I really like and always gets a bad rap. Um, I think that Midsummer Night's Dream is brilliant. I think that it is. I just saw it yesterday, two days ago. I, I, I just, I don't care what production I see of that play. There is, there is joy. Midsummer Night's Dream is a play that, in a lot of ways, riffs off some of the some of the elements of Romeo and Juliet, and it's also a you know you start with a tragedy, a, a sort of relatively horrible, violent tragedy. Romeo and Juliet, we think, oh, this is an easy play. It's not an easy play. It's a really difficult play. So for me, it's a move from what I think of as one of the most difficult plays, Romeo and Juliet, to one of the ones that I find to be the easiest in many ways. Easy because it feels like it wants to have a party with the audience. And that's not true in every scene, that's not true. There are definitely some troubles and there are some moments that are hard. But in general, the play is almost a hug to the audience. I don't like Midsummer Night's Dream either. I think that's like my, <laughs> my Shakespeare dirty little secret. I mean, you have this beautiful female friendship that just gets ripped asunder by dudes. And, and then you have one of the men having to be drugged at the end of it in order to have coupling, enforced, it's like enforced heteronormativity, it's like everything that is, um, you know, and I know the play is asking us to judge that. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it's that sense of, um, of a finer point being made at the end of it. But I have to say, just in terms of the ways in which it's usually staged as a festive summertime performance, outdoors, young love, it's not that play. And I feel like, um, I, I don't know, there's something about the way it gets staged as Shakespeare in the Park that I'm deeply uncomfortable with when you think about the role of parks over time, how much sexual violence happens in parks. And you know, what's interesting about that play is that it, it sort of posits that male bodies were just as vulnerable and it, it, that was true then, it's true now. I don't think we're as invested um, or it's not the first sort of standard story of sexual violence that we tell ourselves, but it's, it's true now as well. And there's something about um, that sense of how the play ends with, with Demetrius still drugged just is uncomfortable. I find it interesting that there is this, this switch, right, this switch, um, both Demetrius just falls out of love with Helen and falls in love with Hermia, but then we also see Lysander through um, external means, of course, through this potion, fall in love with Helena when he was first in love with Hermia. I think the, the play does, the play does sort of play with right, for lack of a better term, the play does play with this idea that we can just fall in and out of love, and albeit people do fall in and out of love, but what do you do when you are in love and you, you can't help it? For a long time, a lot of people thought that works only traveled from the center to the periphery, from the rich nations to the poorer ones, that turns out not really to be how it works at all. So works travel all kinds of different ways. Growing up in Jamaica, we have the, the British school system, right? So we are required to read some um, British writers. And so I think Shakespeare is probably held in the same way in Jamaica as he is in, in America in some ways. Um, he's one of the writers that you need to have read if you have, if you want to claim any kind of social capital. I'm originally from Pakistan and I've seen so many different adaptations of Shakespeare in Pakistan. So Shakespeare in Urdu, Shakespeare in Punjabi, um, and since a very young age my mom 
started reading Shakespeare to me. She's an English professor also. Um, so that's where I got my inspiration from. Shakespeare has been popular in China, especially recently. There have been a couple of film versions just in the last 10 years. But um, the story of Shakespeare's reception in China is, is complicated. Um, one of the reasons for Shakespeare's popularity initially in China in the, in the late 19th century, um, when he was first being kind of translated and imported, was uh, to show that the West was as... Uh, obsessed with or fascinated by ghosts and spirits as any backwards culture. So it actually made the West, Shakespeare made the West seem more behind rather than more, he's often been taken as a figure of modernity, but here he was being taken to be kind of this figure of backwardness and superstition. Shakespeare's world is vast. It's the world of the Renaissance. It's the world of emerging global economies, of science, of militarism, of colonialism, of Renaissance art, of classics. Shakespeare is a people's playwright. Um, he was writing to both the royalty and the common people. And so it doesn't make any sense to me that, that we should take Shakespeare and just put him away in the ivory tower and we can't get to him otherwise. On the frontier, he's a big hit in frontier towns. Um, one famous British actor performed Hamlet, uh, standing on the stump of a redwood tree during the gold rush. So um, they're just, it's uh, everywhere. Oh, Alexis de Tocqueville says, um, when he visits America in the, in the 1830s famously, and he's, he's a French aristocrat and he's trying to figure out these Americans, and he says, you know, in practically every cabin there are a couple of volumes of Shakespeare. And I first read Henry V myself, he says, in a cabin in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, the sense that America is just saturated in Shakespeare in the 19th century and that it is popular culture, it's not high culture at all. You get huge masses of people, working class people, all kinds of people going to the theater all over the country. He understood what it was to be, you know, of the lowest uh, rung of society to those that are the highest, you know. and. And he gave language to all of those different parts of society. My relationship to language has been so complex and so hard, and, and he has made it all worth it. I've had the privilege of working on an adaptation of Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, that was bilingual and um, that really was a very modern take on the story. Um, it was spattered with Spanglish, and um, in, in the inner city in Los Angeles, uh, called Language of Flowers. And it was phenomenal to see um, an entire generation of young people who had never read Shakespeare, they'd only thought of this in a very distant way, um, and to, to, to come and see the play and see themselves in the stories. There's virtually no translations of Shakespeare at all into French for a long, long time, and there maybe up till the 1720s. And there are some real obstacles to performing Shakespeare on the French stage in the 18th century because there are all kinds of rules about what you can perform and what you can't perform on the French stage. And one of them is that lots and lots of words that we would say were just ordinary words, the French say are vulgar and too vulgar for the stage, including words like nose and handkerchief, which make Othello, for example, very hard to produce in France in the 1720s. Um, so when Shakespeare starts to be translated for the first time in, in French in the 18th century, they change everything. They change the language, they change the plots, they get rid of the minor characters because they're very used to classical tragedy and classical comedy, which are simpler uh, in terms of the numbers of characters. And so they get rid of all kinds of things. It's basically completely different. I was in the army and when I was stationed in Germany, that's when I came into contact with Shakespeare. And I saw Shakespeare in German. And I was like, this is fantastic. It was, I could understand some of it, and by some of it I mean very little. I spoke German at the time, conversational German at the time, but that doesn't help you with poetic German. I moved to the United States when I was almost 15 years old. I didn't speak a word of English. I moved in the middle, it's summer in Argentina and winter in the United States, so everything was turned upside down, not just the language, not just the weather, not just my, all of it at once. Um, I lost my parents when I was very young and my brother and I moved here by ourselves and I had a foster family in Idaho Falls, Idaho and I moved from Buenos Aires, Argentina. So it's just a bit of a, of a cultural shock in many ways. Um, but 
I had an excellent drama teacher who, although I couldn't understand what the words were that he was speaking, I knew what he was saying, and that's because he was so expressive with the way he spoke. And I said, in my head, I want to speak that way. When I learn to speak English, I want to speak like he's speaking. The Zulu Macbeth was one of the great emotional and theatrical experiences that I've had. The, the mixing together of the cultures, the Zulu language, the Shakespearean actions. The production that I saw was in London where the Zulu was on a sound assist and I could hear the Zulu in my ear while I was watching the people on stage. They were dancing, they had beautiful, beautiful cuffs around their legs that were about this long from ankle up with bells on them and so on. And the mixing together of those costumes with the Shakespearean language was so rich. I did a Romeo and Juliet out in Colorado Shakespeare Festival where it was a shadowed performance. And what that is, is they get about five or six people that are uh, fluent in sign language and some of them, are, and, and they, so you have two Romeos who were dressed alike, and the, Ro the Romeo would sign whatever I would say, would like to be on the window breaks, the, my, my other shadow Romeo would sign it. And we could use each other, hang on each other's shoulders sometimes. So you have two Romeos and two Juliets. I started reading Shakespeare at A Midsummer Night's Dream for the first time, and I played Titania. I had no idea what, what, what was happening, what I was saying. The forgeries of jealousy speech is not something a 15-year-old should be <laughs> speaking, let alone a foreigner who had no idea even how to speak English in the first place, let alone Shakespeare's poetry. It's an archaic idea that, um, that we historically in the United States even um, have been a party to, which is that Shakespeare's English, the King's English, shouldn't be spoken by people of color. And it was an extraordinary, extraordinary experience to recognize that it is, again, can be owned and embodied by anyone. All I wanted when I was a teenager was to be understood in one way or another. And I think we all go through that phase. And I actually couldn't be, not because I was a complicated teenager, which I was, or because I was emotionally disturbed, which I was. but. It was because I simply couldn't. I couldn't form the words, I didn't know the language, and somehow I learned it. I listened, and I watched, and I learned how to speak it. And I feel like that's what Shakespeare did when he wrote these plays. He listened, and he watched the world around him, and how it all worked, and all the different classes of people. All Elizabethan England was not, uh, one kind of culture. It was a conglomeration of all these different people coming together from all different parts of the world. And he put them all on that stage for everyone to hear. He has jokes for the higher class and the middle class and the lower class. It doesn't matter where you're from. He has something for you. And I felt like he kind of went like this and said, come here, let's tell some stories now that you know how. If we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here. While wow, these visions did appear. And this weakened idle theme. No more yielding, but a dream. Gentles do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck. Now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar come. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends. And Robin shall restore amends.